The year was 1996, and during this time, the video game market was in the middle of a transition. We were moving from the traditional 2D games of the generation before to now 3D rendered games with a drastic increase in polygons due to the leap in technology and the hardware in this generation of consoles. At this time, the PlayStation had been released the prior year and the demographic seemed to be targeted towards young adults. The console was a massive success and through its success, we got many memorable games. And in 1996, we got a game that would define its own genre of gaming and would lead to a massive franchise that is beloved by many well over 25 years later. This game was Resident Evil. And this is my Resident Evil retrospective. Resident Evil Retrospective Resident Evil began as an idea from Tokuro Fujiwara as a remake of his prior game Sweet Home which was released in 1989 on the NES and together with Shinji Mikami as the lead director of the project they began development on Resident Evil in 1993 with the Super Nintendo in mind as development continued, the game began to undergo many changes, taking inspiration from films such as The Shining with the Overlook Hotel in mind. Mikami wanted to develop a 3D first-person psychological horror that was close enough to the original Sweet Home. This soon changed, however, when Mikami learned of the game Alone in the Dark. After playing this and seeing how effective the use of third person with fixed camera angles were in regards to using pre-rendered backgrounds, he decided to make the change. Due to the limitations of the original PlayStation, it was too difficult to have everything rendered in 3D. Another change happened midway through development as Mikami attempted to have the game be a co-op game along with real-time weapon changes, similar to how modern Resident Evil games are. The co-op idea was scrapped, however, as Mikami felt it was not good enough. This local co-op would eventually make its way back with Resident Evil 5. For the intro of the game, they decided to use live-action full-motion video, which, let's be honest, gave us the best and cheesiest intro in any Resident Evil game. Alpha Team is flying around the forest zone, situated in northwest Raccoon City, where we're searching for the helicopter of our compatriots, Bravo Team, who disappeared during the middle Chris, of our mission. You found it? No, I haven't found it yet. Bizarre murder cases have recently occurred in Raccoon City. There are outlandish reports of families being attacked by a group of about ten people. Victims were apparently eaten. Bravo Team went to the hideout of the group and disappeared. Look, Chris! It was Bravo Team's helicopter. Nobody was in it. But strangely, most of the equipment was still there. However, we soon discovered why.
three STARS members left now. Captain Wesker, Jill, and myself. We don't know where Barry is. Chris Redfield. Jill Valentine. Barry Burton. Rebecca Chambers. Albert Wesker. Resident Evil. Using American actors combined with the best B-movie character introductions, it was extremely cringeworthy in all the best ways possible. As much as I loved the original Resident Evil, it really does not hold up well in comparison to its PS1 sequels. The dialogue, while laughably memorable, where were you the first time you heard Jill Sandwich, is really bad. That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right. Barry, thanks for saving my life. But Barry, didn't you say you are going back to the dining room to do some research? Why on earth are you here? Uh, I just had something I wanted to check. Now, let's get back to searching for the lost captain and Chris, shall we? Later entries seem to fix this by putting more effort into the script and voice acting. The graphics, while impressive at the time, just can't keep up with the improvements made in Resident Evil 2, which holds up so much better. But this aside, where the game does hold up is in the design itself. The game takes place in three major locations, the Spencer Mansion, the dormitory, aka the guardhouse, and the umbrella lab. The game was designed to be a giant puzzle with smaller puzzles throughout. This keeps you exploring for different key items to help you progress in a similar way a Metroid game would. And so you find yourself running back and forth throughout these locations, which can lead you to running into enemies and wasting your limited resources. First-timers would usually have a difficult time running through the game as they would be unaware that a good portion of the zombies could be avoided. And Cerberus could be completely avoided, to be honest. Speaking of enemies, you have a variety of creatures known as BOWs, bio-organic weapons. The most common you'll find are zombies that are scattered throughout each location. Next, the Cerberus, which are mutated Dobermans. These are usually found in outside locations, usually, and are much quicker, but as I mentioned, can be easily avoided. Once you enter the guardhouse, you begin to encounter giant spiders. These can poison you, and if you kill them, they can explode and release a bunch of baby spiders, an arachnophobia's nightmare. Fun fact, I actually have spiders like this by my house. They're called wolf spiders, and they carry the babies on their abdomen. And if I step on it, all the babies start to scatter. Seriously, it's nightmare fuel. Returning from the guardhouse, you begin to encounter hunters, which are bipedal reptiles with giant claws that can get a critical hit and cut your head off. They can be difficult to kill as they are resistant to handgun bullets and move very quickly. Finally, at the end of the game, you encounter Chimera, which I don't know what they are to be honest. I almost feel like Mikami had just watched the movie The Fly and thought it'd be cool to include something that looked like that. Throughout the game, there are also boss battles, but I'll leave that for you to discover. The story is an interesting one, as you have two stories being told. Aside from the fact that you get to pick your character in the beginning, the stories being told are that of the STARS members, Special Tactics and Rescue Service who ended up at the mansion after responding to a distress call from their fellow team members. And the other story is that of the outbreak itself. The story with your character is being told in real time, which I like to think Jill has a more complete story, but 
Again, I'll leave that up to you to decide. While the story of the outbreak is being told by notes and files you pick up that were left behind by the residents. This is a fantastic way to tell these events as you let your own imagination fill in the gaps. This form of storytelling is still done in today's Resident Evil titles. The gameplay is a case of less is more. And love it or hate it, a lot of the success is driven by the tense situations the tank controls and fixed camera angles cause. By having the tank controls, you have to know to keep your distance from enemies as you are unable to shoot and move at the same time. This can easily cause you to be backed into a corner as the undead begin to close on you. Healing is done by use of first aid spray or smoking the Raccoon City herbs. I honestly don't know if they eat the herbs or what, but I feel like the fact that when you combine them, they look ready to be rolled up. So we're just going to say that these characters are taking the edge off so they can survive this. The inventory system is limited by allowing only 6 to 8 item slots total depending on which character you choose. But this limitation is assisted by the linked item boxes that have been added to the various save rooms. The music in this first entry, while good, isn't as memorable as RE2 and RE3. The music does fit the tones of the game, giving you that feeling of being alone, coupled with the sense of dread and death around every corner. At least if you're playing any version except the Director's Cut DualShock version. We'll get to that. This brings us to the different versions of the game. While I'm not going to go into the graphical differences between them, I'll leave that to my buddy Jared from Avalanche Reviews, I do want to note a few key things. First, in the original releases of the game, the difficulty was turned up for the American release. They did this by removing the auto-aiming feature and reduced the number of ink ribbons for saving, which resulted in one of the most difficult Resident Evil experiences to date. Mikami stated this was asked to be done at the request of the American departments so the game could be rented more often and not finished so easily in one sitting. Sleazy, but mission accomplished. Second, the American and European versions of the Director's Cut still had the intro censored despite the claims that the director's cuts would have uncensored content. Third, the DualShock version of the director's cut featured a different orchestrated soundtrack that almost all fans cringe when they hear it. This is mostly due to the sad clown music that plays in the basement. <laughs> Enemies were revamped in the director's cut version from the original. Faster paced zombies were introduced which would catch veterans of the original game off guard. Forrest Speyer was able to come to life as a zombie on the balcony as well, which did not happen in the original release. And finally, the director's cut offered an arrange mode, which was intended to give players of the original a new challenge. In arrange mode, enemies and item locations will be changed. And to be honest, this is my personal preferred way to play as my brain will play tricks on me making me think an item is in a certain location, but not be there. The last thing I want to touch on is replayability. Replayability is what drives the success of games of this length. You see, Resident Evil can be finished on an average of between 5 to 7 hours on a first playthrough, with subsequent runs taking significantly less time. So it's very important to keep your player base invested by giving reasons for them to start a new game. In modern era, this is done through a new game plus mechanic. In Resident Evil, it is done through unlocking new content once certain criteria has been met. The unlockables in this case would be new costumes or weapons with unlimited ammo. Unlockables such as these keep players invested as well as adding multiple endings. The endings in this game are highly dependent on who survives to the end of the game and this is determined by your own actions throughout the game. There is a total of 8 different endings in the game. 
four for Chris and four for Jill. With all these reasons to keep coming back to the game, I think they nailed replayability. As I mentioned prior, the original Resident Evil does not really hold up these days as the sequels did. But that doesn't mean you can't enjoy the game. Even in later entries, the games acknowledge the cheesy dialogue from the first game, and this is exactly why I would recommend playing it. It's not perfect, but it can be difficult and it will always give you a good time. Just make sure, if you play as Jill, you bring a sandwich. You'll thank me later. I want to give a big thank you to everybody who supported the channel, to my members, to my subscribers, and the family in Discord, which you guys are free to join at any time. So thank you all so much for watching the video and for supporting the channel as long as you guys have been. Next time, I'll see you in Raccoon City.